What is happening, everybody? Welcome to Off the Rails, a recovery podcast dedicated to ending the stigma of addiction through open discussion on all things recovery related. My name is Mark, and with me always are Dave and Jared. And today we have a very special guest, and Jared's going to introduce her. Yeah, so today we are excited to have Katzia on the show. She's a fellow Canadian from Edmonton, Alberta, originally. (laughs) She does sober support and helps create a space for people to hear their own voice and to guide you to a place of understanding your worth and so much more I'm sure she will touch on. So yeah, welcome. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, As we're kind of talking about before, Katsia, we get our guests to kind of come on and share their stories, uh, how they, their experience with addiction and kind of how they're going through their own recovery. So we hope by sharing people's stories that we can help other people in their current addiction or in their recovery. So would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's always nice to speak to fellow Canadians as well. Um, I live in the States now, so a lot of the interviews that I do, they make fun of certain words that I say. <laughs> and I'm like, like about, and I'm like, we don't actually, it, from Edmonton, I don't feel like we say it really that differently. Anyway, um, but thank you so much for having me. Um, And I'm just always grateful for the opportunity to share my story and also to just help people understand that um, that they can reach out for help and that they can learn from other people's stories. You know, I guess I don't know if you want me to start where I started, where the drinking started getting bad. For me, it wasn't. I didn't start in high school, so it was kind of a later evolution of my drinking. I don't know if that's kind of where you want to start or childhood. Um, Yeah, I think uh, a lot of times we'll just do like a bit of background and like, so you were born in Edmonton? Yeah. Okay, and what kind of family life did you have growing up? So I am the oldest of two. I have a younger brother. Um, I just turned 40 last year. My brother's, I guess he's turned 38 pretty standard upbringing. My parents are not alcoholics. I was not raised in a home where there was addiction, no abuse or anything like that. We went to church. Um, I always felt different to my parents and my brother. My brother is very similar to them in a lot of ways. In sobriety, I've learned that I'm actually similar to some of the things I thought I wasn't. But back then, all I wanted to do was leave home. I I sort of, I had a plan that as soon as I would turn 17 or 18, I was going to go to college. I was going to get my own place um, and move out. And I did kind of do that. I, I started working in a call center for a company called Intuit. They did um, like tax software and, and stuff like that. And got an apartment with two girls from work and moved out, I guess, right around when I was 18. And I met a guy at my work and he was British. He had come over with, um, with some, a UK team. And I ended up, long story short, ended up moving to the UK for close to seven years. Um, so that was kind of my 20s. And my drinking and my, you know, partying and stuff was very normal then. It wasn't, in high school, I didn't, like I didn't, I had one big party and I remember like, I was pretty nerdy and I was pretty shy in high school and somehow word got around that my parents weren't going to be home. I was sort of dating this guy that um, came from a different background and he, he was like, let's have a party. Yeah, that party did not end well. And that was me getting drunk on Mike's hard lemonades and like a field and like wandering the neighborhood with my boyfriend and there was cops and stuff that has something unrelated but anyway that that was the extent of drinking back then and it was I I don't even think I thought about it because I think like I said I was brought up in a home where my parents would have like wine with dinner sometimes they'd go through like phases of like my dad would read some article that would say like red wine with dinner was healthy or whatever and so we'd have red wine in the house um and and then that was that was it or they'd have friends over they'd have drinks pretty much um that was the extent of it so moved overseas and 
who lived there for for seven years and I couldn't have gotten like further away <laughs> from Edmonton like that was my that was my goal and I think that's when I started like really feeling even more different so as opposed to trying to like form a relationship with my family or trying to like um find things that I had in common with them I really just like pushed them further away and and traveled around Europe traveled around Southeast Asia like did a bunch of you know growth during that time went to school um did my undergrad there in English literature and it was all it was it was a really great experience at that time in my life the the guy I was dating was not a drinker we weren't partiers um we did like the standard kind of partying we we went to some cool places we did like Ibiza and like stuff like that like it was good memories but it was it was nothing like it would later become yeah. so in those seven years it wasn't you didn't see it as an issue at all no never I don't think like you know when you talk to people who struggle with drinking and they talk about like no matter what the situation you'd be thinking about when your next drink was or you'd be planning ways to get to the liquor store or how you could go to venues that served alcohol those things never crossed my mind so like if we went out for a night we had a bunch of drinks I would never like keep alcohol in the house unless we were going out right pretty normal normal type drinking um and that's what it was at that time was just all all for the sake of like partying and stuff like that which was very seldom yeah so you were able to have an off switch back then too? Yeah, I think, I think I, I don't think I can remember at that point ever blacking out or anything when I drank, but looking back now at when I thought it became a problem, i.e. in my mid thirties versus when it actually, like I actually started getting blackouts was a lot earlier, but I've only discovered that through the work, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've done in my sobriety now. I didn't know, I never I always said to people, oh, I never had blackouts. I never had blackouts until the last few years of drinking. And that wasn't true. Um, but it's amazing the way you kind of have like selective memory when it comes to that. And you sort of think you're like, oh no, no, that was never a problem. And I'm, and now that I look, I'm like, actually probably like 10 years before there was already like signs of it being problematic. So, yeah. Yeah. So after the seven years from there, um, where did you go? Where did you kind of head to? Yeah, I ended up back in Edmonton. Um, around that time, my relationship was breaking up. This is 2007. My relationship was coming to an end. My grandfather was in the hospital. He was dying at that point and I decided to make the move back to Edmonton which I swore that I would never do I was like I'm never coming back <clears throat> I'm only going to visit my family this is it right coldest place on earth and um and I came back and I the only reason I think I really ended up staying for a long time was I got offered a really good job in recruitment with this like IT consulting company and they offered me this package that I like couldn't turn down so all of a sudden I had this high powered job, downtown Edmonton. I had my own like office situation. I'd never had these things before. I was 27 and looking back now to answer what you were saying, Dave, is like, that's when I think things started getting problematic is um, there was a big drinking culture. So the company was owned by four owners. And one of them was the president of the company. And we had like a, like a little wine bar in the building that I worked in. There was like a whole Renfrew and stuff like that. And we would go down there pretty much every night after work and drink. But it was just, it was normal, right? And, and I had recently broken up with someone. I was like, oh, this is just, you know, I'm living downtown, living on Jasper Ave, like going out. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but so, so that was three years, I think I was, or two and a half years, something like that. After that, I left that company, I got laid off, I went to Australia for um, a couple months, I did some traveling around Australia, and then um, around BC, and I had a girlfriend living in Kelowna, like one of my best friends from school, and she knew I was kind of um, looking for somewhere to end up, and she said, hey, me and my boyfriend are in Kelowna, want to come out here, 
And I don't know how much you all know about Kelowna or <laughs> what the culture there is like, but that that was that was the beginning of it getting pretty bad. Yeah. What kind of culture are we looking at in Kelowna? Uh, there's a very heavy drug culture. Um, I was working when I first moved there. So I, I moved in with her and her boyfriend and I was basically a lot of the industry there like is service industry based. So you're working in a restaurant, you're working in a bar, you're working in a club. And um, I got a job doing like promoting for a club there. I don't know if it's still there. It's called Level. And um, we would get like all the big DJs and all the big shows and stuff would come into town. And I had never experienced partying like that before, like partying for days, kind of partying, right? And it was, it, it's like a slippery slope. You don't realize that you're in it until you're in it. And all of a sudden it's like, the bar closes, but the bar closes at say three, and then you go to an after party, and then you go to another after party. And it's just, it, it continues. And I couldn't hold down a job. I, um, I was working in retail or something at that point, because there was really no like blue chip companies or anything there. And my, I think, I think with the, the long-term relationship breaking up, I was just kind of like floating for that whole time and drinking and partying just swoops in when you're like vulnerable like that right you see it's like attractive you're like oh these people are cool they accept me I'm just gonna build my life here and on the outside it looks it's got this like veneer of being really put together but underneath it all I'd be hungover or still partying for like days and days I I, I look at pictures now I was like 90 pounds you know like it was and, and that's when I met the guy that I would later be with for like five years. And he's my daughter's father now. So that that's where that started was in 2009, I guess, 2010. And then we, him and I ended up moving to Ontario in 2010. So his mom was living out there and she offered us um, rent free in her basement. I was planning on going back to school. I was like, great, we can sort our lives out we can get things on track, but drinking, drinking wasn't the, I say it wasn't the problem. I feel like it wasn't at the forefront, but of course with everything else, drinking was always like there, right? I don't think I would have done necessarily a lot of that stuff if I hadn't been drinking. So yeah, so that brought us to Ontario in 2010. I find it, I find it interesting just to uh, touch back on you know, the big job you had in Edmonton and like that mm -hmm. culture of um, a lot of places have with the drinking after work or a lot of yeah. um, employers even encourage or have drinks in the office. And I don't know what, if they kind of realize the habits they're setting their employees up for possibly no. um, they're trying to do a good thing to create a, you know, a nice loving culture, but. Um, but oh yeah. yeah. I think, I think they don't, I think the intention is correct, but I also like the, the company I worked for in particular, the owners were all, especially the president was like an extreme narcissist. So I think like he wanted to create this culture where he hired, you know, attractive women to work in the office and then like him and the other owners would be out <clears throat> selling the work like we did like they would bid on like government projects and things and at that time in Alberta like the oil industry was really booming so I think that was like a big part of it so like all this money's flowing into the company we're wanting to attract other vendors so we're like quote unquote like whining dining them they're coming out and drinking with us but I don't think they they would realize and like years later he reached out to me on LinkedIn and I was like <laughs> like do we not remember how bad things went like it just I don't know it just but that culture is still so prevalent there's like even now obviously there's companies that have you know you must talk to people who work in places where there's alcohol in, on the premises too like back then we didn't have that at work but it was at our disposal yeah, yeah. so I think that's a really good point is like maybe some people were doing it unintentionally but I think it was really you were almost like excluded from things if you didn't go really hard you know. Katia what was the driving factor that made you want to get sober? 
For me, two things. My daughter, my daughter's seven and a half now. And I got sober when she was five and a half. Yeah, I'm coming up on two years sober this this year. Um, so her and then our, my big move here to the States. I didn't want to, I got married last year and I didn't want to start my like quote unquote new life here. It kind of like, it sounds like a geographic sort of thing, you know, when people are like, oh, I thought I'd move and it would just, everything would magically sort itself out. But it wasn't like that. It was more like I had this opportunity to really get my life on track and by that point I had become very secretive with my drinking like my fiance is not a problem or my now husband but at that time he was not a problem drinker take it or leave it nowadays he never drinks we don't keep alcohol in the house I'm very blessed and privileged that way but I think those two things just wanting to be a better parent and a better partner not to backtrack a bit, but you went, you said you moved to Ontario. Mm -hmm. Um, So you were living there with your partner's parents at the time. Yeah. My daughter heard her, her father, so his family. Mm -hmm. Um, So were you, you were drinking then, right? We were still partying in the ways that we were because really I thought that moving would give us the fresh start and if it had just been me it probably would have but we were in um a relationship where we enabled each other and we kind of fed off that lifestyle and actually like our relationship was so dysfunctional without that that really the partying and the drinking and stuff just allowed me to cope with how bad things were and so yeah things were things were still the same that they they ever were and they got worse because I I couldn't handle being with him that was not that was not good when you're living in someone else's house and you're trying to like carry on a lifestyle like that it just the problems mount up from there what um did you stay there for a long time we lived there for two years, I think. And no, maybe, a, yeah, two years. And then we got our own place. So we were in Oakville at that time. And then we moved to Burlington. And things were, again, the same. But what happened was when I got pregnant with my daughter, I thought, and I was sober through that whole pregnancy. And I thought, okay, this is it. Like, And I really at that point knew that things weren't going to work with us long term so I left him when she was 10 months old and it was kind of like a midnight move like I hadn't told my parents my parents were in Edmonton and I was all the way across the country I hadn't told them anything about how bad things were and I I remember just calling them one night from the lobby of our apartment and being like things are really bad like I need to get out of this situation and my mom flew down And she, he worked in a car dealership and he was at work one day and we just like, over the course of a week, we had like started like slowly moving stuff out of the apartment. And then I just like, I left with our daughter and that started like a year of like slowly ripping this bandaid off because he did not want us to leave and he tried to win me back. And he had a lot of like mental control over that situation at that point. Um, Cause my self-esteem and my self-worth was really low. Um, but yeah, so I left when she was 10 months old and then I was a single parent um, up until, up until she was like three and a half. So that's when I met my now husband. And that period of time, like those few years, that's when the drinking was the worst. As a new parent, as a single parent, um, the mommy wine culture was kind of like starting to take off at that point too. I didn't realize anything about what that was called then. And uh, and now I'm like, oh, this this is what it was. Play dates and, and booze and, and that kind of stuff. It was It was bad. So that that's the nutshell of like the five years of Ontario kind of thing. When you're talking about moving the first time, you know, when you moved to Ontario and you just kind of talk about what you thought that would kind of change, you know, your lifestyle a little bit. And then when you went to the States, you know, you made sure it was one of the big factors of you quitting drinking. Yeah. You know, what was the big, what was the big factor in that sticking that time was your environment with your, with your fiance being so supportive and, and being on board with it all or yeah that- yeah I think that had a big part to do with it I think also 
by the point that we were moving to the States, um, it was like, we moved here December, 2020. So he grew up where we live right now in, in Pennsylvania and he was here. And my daughter and I had planned basically, um, long story short, our immigration interview was planned for March when COVID hit in 2020, got postponed to October. We had to go to Montreal to do our interview and we moved in December. I got sober November 1st. So it was like, like a month and a half later or whatever. And we ended up here. But I think at that point I had been trying to like actually quit for over a year but like trying to moderate for a couple of years before that and I was physically dependent on alcohol and I think I was ending up going into withdrawal every time I would quit so I'd go to a doctor get um get prescribed benzos to try and quit safely end up drinking while I was taking the benzos really dangerous stuff and I just felt like I felt like if I didn't give it a shot then to actually take the medication they had given me that last time, withdraw safely and, and put myself in like a place, like a physical and mental environment where I could get well. I just didn't know how many more like opportunities I would have. I think it just felt really serious. I was like, oh my God. Like I, and I, he didn't know the extent of it. Even when I told him, like I started going to sobriety meetings. Like I got sober in the luckiest club. Um, and that, that was the sobriety support community that I found, um, just by, by chance, I started listening to Laura McCown and Holly's podcast home and they, they had that. And then I, I got sober through there. But I, when I told my fiance, he was like, what you're so like, you're getting sober. He didn't realize that I even had a problem. It's mind blowing. The extent that we can conceal this from the people that love us you know there's things he remembers now where he's like he'll say like oh I remember that time I came drove up to Canada to visit you and I remember smelling alcohol but he wouldn't think anything of it because a normal person would be like oh you had a glass of wine with dinner it was like oh no I had like you know a bottle of wine so I think you know I was using it to cope with anxiety with social anxiety also with like this overwhelming feeling that I was going to screw that relationship up to, to your point of like, did it have to do with him? I think it had to do with not wanting, my husband's like a really down to earth, supportive, amazing person. And I think I just like, was like, I can't screw this up. <laughs> so there was a bit of that. Um, you mentioned the luckiest, what is it called the luckiest club? Yeah, TLC. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of speak about what that is for the listeners out there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so there's a book called We Are the Luckiest, which would be classified as Quitlet. And the author is a woman named Laura McCowan. And she, when the pandemic started, she decided to start hosting Zoom sobriety meetings because she felt that there was a need for it. There was a lot of like, a lot of people were being, uh, feeling lonely, their regular AA meetings weren't available for them. Um, and so I got like, I signed up to some newsletter that she had, and I saw that she was starting these meetings. I was like, oh, okay, I'll go and check it out. And that was in like the summer, towards the end of the summer of 2020, I guess. And I went to these meetings, there's Zoom meetings, you can keep your camera off, you don't have to share with your voice. You could technically still be drinking, which I was when I started going. And I would just listen to these people's stories. And now they've grown. They've got like 45 support meetings a week. They've got all sorts of like subgroups, you know, for um, different demographics, like sexual orientation and stuff, uh, women's meetings, men's meetings. Um, they've done some live meetups. This year I went to Boston back in May and I actually got to like meet sober people which was really cool to be in a room sometimes like some of the people you see on the screen but then just like I don't know you just like picture what these people are going to be like and it's like such a good energy you know um so now nowadays I attend probably two or three meetings a week I will say I don't attend a lot of meetings but I truly I believe it's for people that don't um that don't want to go to a meeting where there's maybe religion or dogma or anything like that. So they don't do any of that. They accept all paths to recovery. There's people in their community who got sober in AA who still attend that, who are looking to like 
add something to their sobriety toolkit. Um, and it's and it's really relatively cheap for for what it is. So they do book clubs and stuff now. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I love uh, I love hearing people's like different stories and like their groups that they attend. And mm-hmm. basically, I love also like being able to provide additional resources for people. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, that's been a that's been a really it's nice to try different things. I think when I talk to people now, um, just yesterday actually, I hosted a voice only meeting through an app called Circles, which does mental health support. Um, and they do they have a part of their app that does um, that's like Zoom meetings for different types of um, mental health support. So it could be for t- infertility, it could be divorce, it could be grief, it could be sobriety. So I'm hosting a sobriety meeting every Sunday and it's voice only. And it was pretty cool. There was 10 of us and people can just um, like, I think I might do a topic or whatever, but people can just pop in with whatever they want to ask, or if they're looking for extra support. Yesterday, someone wanted to um, get advice on how, how to stop going to places where she was going to feel tempted. So she's like, there's this one gas station I always go to. And I said, yeah, I bet they have like your order ready for you. Like, here's your smokes, here's your drink, whatever. And she's like, yeah, I'm like, same. By the end, I had like three different liquor stores and I would like, you know, think I was being sneaky with like, oh, they haven't seen me here today. I'll go to this one, (laughs) you know? So, um, but that, you know, the voice only people can be anonymous. And there was a girl in there with like, you know, six days. And it really like is humbling because it puts me back to like being in that early stage and kind of going in and out. Before I ever got sober, I was curious about it. And I tried for like quite a while, you know? And and so I think it's, it, you know, to remember that and to talk to people who are in that stage is really important as well. How many, t- how many times do you think you tried to actually get sober? Uh, did you actually try yeah. hard at it? So in that last year, I probably, I probably tried with like medication and with like going to like the ER and stuff, probably a year and a half, I think four times. And I would get like, so I would do the meds. I'd be like, okay, everything's good. I wouldn't tell anybody. Like I would tell people it was like a panic attack or whatever. And I've since found out in sobriety that I have ADHD, which was like this amazing revelation because it explained so many things that had happened in my life. Like why I couldn't hold down a job and why I was always like working on all these projects, why I felt awkward in social situations. But um, I would, yeah. So I would go to the ER, get those meds be okay for like a week or so and then slip back into that like okay well this time like so I stopped drinking wine because I was like oh I'm getting fat from drinking all this wine so I'm going to start drinking like you know socialites so I was drinking socialites and like shots of fireball and like vodka in my freezer like it was it was all this stuff but for the last you know year of it I was a morning drinker because I just couldn't I could not and that's when I started getting really worried so like they would prescribe something like Ativan well, you shouldn't be taking out a van and then drinking immediately after that, right? No idea how dangerous that was until now. And I'm like, in sobriety, and I look back and I'm like, I could have died many times, you know? So I'd say for anyone out there who's like, oh, I've tried so many times, like maybe it's just not going to work for me. Keep trying, keep trying until you find something that works because they're really there really is so many different avenues now to getting sober. I think we're really lucky to live in the age that we live in and not, you know, back in the day when it was like, oh, you have to attend X number, you know, 90 meetings in 90 days, which does work for a lot of people. But I think there's so many other paths now. I had a question. So, you know, moving can be very stressful and mm-hmm. you, you move to a different country alone early in recovery. Um, yeah. How are you able to kind of handle that stress and and stay sober throughout that time that's a great question for me I think it comes down to my routines I have a really set morning routine and that was something that I had to like try a bunch of different things in early sobriety so I tried doing actual meditation for half hour every morning and I was like this doesn't work I tried recently I tried pulling a tarot card every day (laughs) somebody was like oh this is you know this is what I do (laughs) 
And I think that that's what I said. It was like a trial and error of things. But in sobriety, I learned that if I, in order for me to feel grounded and to feel able to accomplish things in my day, um, I have to get up early before other people in my house get up because I need that time before my daughter and my husband are both very like high energy, like frenetic people. <laughs> and if I don't do that, I will get thrown into that vibe and I'll absorb all that energy. So, and part of that too also was like, really turning down the external noise. So there was a lot, there's a lot of people out there that want to tell you a lot of different things or, you know, people from my past or friendships that were like confused as to why I was choosing this path. And in the beginning, I think it's totally perfectly acceptable to protect yourself from that. So the routines, um, exercise every day I work out whether it's a walk I work out at the gym quite a bit just moving my body I find is really useful a lot of times when you're sitting and thinking about the stuff that's piling on top of you then you're more likely to turn to that drink if you don't have those positive outlets you know um and I think what I also did, I I'm a writer and I'd always said I was a writer but I was never able to actually write anything when I was drinking so part of my recovery had been like figuring out what that career path looked like and I ended up starting my business um, January 1st this year and so I'm doing that now and I think connecting with people that way has been really important as well you know I think if you can find like one or two connections that are that are nourishing you then that's all that you need can you tell yeah. us a little more about um about the business yeah um it's a creative business. So it's called Ketsia Calvert Creative. And I host writing workshops. So last summer, I had this idea, I was like, I want to have conversations with people and talk about things that are going on in their lives, but help them also to kind of like memoir style writing slash journaling slash like working through trauma and healing and stuff like that. And I didn't know what that would look like. Uh, and so I put this, I put this thing on my Facebook and I put um, like a little, I went on Canva and made this like terrible ad or whatever, a flyer and put it on Eventbrite and just wanted to see it was like a free workshop, whatever. And it's amazing the people that you attract when you just kind of put yourself out there in that way, had no clue what I was doing. I don't know if you guys found that. I don't know if you come from a background where you were doing radio or anything, but like when you start a podcast, you're like, how the hell do I do this? And you're on YouTube and you're like looking all this, that was me. I was like, okay, how do I run a writer's workshop? You know, And it just kind of evolved um, and it's been really fulfilling. And so now it's paid, now people pay. Um, but back then I wasn't legally allowed to work or earn money until my green card came through. And so for me, it was the perfect time to like set up a business. My husband was like, go do what you want with it. So, um, I have people in England, I have people in Europe, um, in Canada, in the States. So it's, it's been good. So I, I hold workshops now, um, a few times a week and yeah. I do. I also do like um, a sobriety book club as well um, for women. So that that's I don't know what the evolution of it looks like. Like for me, I think my heart has been in, in the recovery and the sobriety community throughout this whole journey. And my like my Instagram, for example, was always pretty small and pretty tame. And then around like I think it was around Christmas last year, something went viral and then all of a sudden my account blew up and I just felt this like calling. I was like, I can, you know, connect with people in that way. And as a writer, I get like, I get feedback from people saying like, you know, you're able to put into words something that I've been feeling. And for me, that was at the heart of what I was doing, you know? So that's what I'm doing now. That is incredible. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about uh, one of your, your most recent posts on Instagram, mm. just talking about how you're taking a break there. Yes. Did you want to, could you speak on that a little bit? When I posted that, this was a few weeks ago, I feel like social media is such a, a blessing, but it can also be a trap. And 
what I was feeling, what I do sometimes, <laughs> my form of writing, sometimes if I have an idea, like in the middle of the night, I'll grab my phone or early morning, like my husband gets up at 345 to go to work because he's crazy. And like, he'll wake up, he'll leave and I'll, I'll roll over and I'll just press my like record and I'll send myself like these voice notes. And they're all like, you know, groggy morning voice, whatever. But like later I'll transcribe it because I don't want to lose I feel like you lose a train of thought sometimes when you have like a really good idea. And this is one way dictation has been a really successful way for me to capture that. Um, but anyway, that morning, as usual, Instagram changes their algorithm all the time. And it really, are, are we allowed to swear? Can I swear? <laughs> it really fucking pisses me off because I'm like, <laughs> I literally just had like, you know, such good engagement for quite a while on my posts. And then out of nowhere, things were going down. And I was talking to some of my other friends who um, are in the sober community, kind of same thing. And they were like, yeah, my posts also aren't. And I just like, I was really like upset about it. Cause I was like, I feel like I had a voice. I, I have things that resonate for people. People reach out and I, I genuinely care about them and about talking to them. I'm very good at like replying to things and stuff like that. And then, you know, that little part of me, I guess, was addicted maybe in some way to the dopamine that you get off of that validation, if I'm being honest. And, th and that's what I, then, then so that sent me into the spiral of like being mad at myself for actually caring as to why I wasn't getting likes on these. And that post got like, you know, 800 likes. And I was like, okay, so people are there. So then I started thinking, so it is my content. Cause you know, there's all those like, um, those uh, accounts and, and people on Instagram, they're trying to help you, you know, with your marketing and stuff. And they're like, well, maybe you're just not posting quality content. And I was like, I'm going to not follow you. And so I, I really went on <laughs> this like, thing of like, I'm going to unfollow all the people that make me feel bad. And then it's like, you have that inner dialogue where you're like, Ketsia, why is that making you feel bad? And I think in sobriety, you have, you can um, separate yourself and you're almost like watching yourself do these things and dissecting why you do them. I don't know if it's just me, but that's what I was in. And that post, the amount of feedback I got, like in the DMs and all that kind of stuff, people, and I pinned it and people, I think, think that some people comment now thinking it's like a new post also, but I wanted it to be a conversation. So yeah, social media, like you guys, like you're saying, you're on it because that's where your audience is. That's where you're connecting with people. But I feel, I feel very protective too of like the people in early sobriety, because I, I think it can really mess with your head. And that's the other part that I like want to shelter people from too, you know, that, that part has been some of the feedback you get, I'm writing a, a piece on it right now, like an, an op-ed piece about like the the dark underbelly of the sobriety influencer community because <laughs> I feel like there's so much there's there is a dark side to any community but I feel like I've just really noticed it the more my account's grown and and I'm very you know picky about the the types of um connections and stuff that I make and the types of interviews and things like that yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question about that post, but it was literally born from like me talking to my phone to me transcribing it in the notes of my phone. And I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to post it. I was so mad that day. And, uh, and it made me feel better, you know? Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely, uh, answer my questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm social media. I, I'm just, I don't know too much about it. So the, all the whole world of it all is very, uh, kind of new to me and yeah so yeah it's anyway. not it's not intuitive either like because of the algorithm you can think that something's really gonna land and then it just like bombs and you're like oh so like for me it's the engagement like when I'm getting people talking about things or when I'm like when I'm getting people within the comments like supporting each other or being like hey um this is working for me this is not working for me, that kind of stuff. I think that's why I do it, you know? So it's been useful in that way. Do you find that, um, I guess, like being able to help people has been kind of helpful in your own personal recovery? It's really um, humbling to be able to 
just talk to people at all different stages of recovery because sometimes people will be like, oh, you make it look easy. And I was like, well, I guess in some ways, but I share my stories pretty openly. I think I just also, if someone, for example, I said my morning routine, but my night routine, if you guys had asked me to do this interview at 9 p.m., I would have said no, because I know that if I stay up doing an interview and I'm all wired up from that, like till 10 o'clock, that I'm going to be garbage at 345 when my husband gets up and I'm awake for the day, right? So I think boundaries is a big part of that too, you know, but it is very important to not forget where you came from because you I could end up back there. Something could happen and I could be back where, where I was and it would be worse. You know, every time you go back out, I truly believe that it's worse. Absolutely. That was an amazing yeah. point. Have you uh, put yourself around alcohol or in any situations that could have been dangerous, but you had like a plan to get out? <laughs> yes uh so last year we got married we got married in vegas <laughs> and then we went to vegas this year in february it's my husband's favorite place to go he he's a blackjack guy and uh it was always our plan to get married in vegas but when we when the actual wedding came along i was it was in may of last year i was like seven months um sober and uh, the amount of like emotional sobriety work that been planning that went into that like imagine like um early sobriety so like how tenuous and how like unstable things feel at that point and and Vegas is like one of the big triggers for me drinking is like I love dancing I love um I used to love clubbing like things like that well there you are you're in the center of all of that when you're in Vegas there's this like buzz and excitement right um, and my husband's like a really low key guy, but he, he likes, you know, gambling. Right. And so anyway, so we were there for like four days and three nights and we had a very small wedding. There was like nine of us, very low key, but I hadn't announced my sobriety to the world yet. I, I was still in that like little cocoon where you're in like the sobriety Instagram world or like the sobriety support meetings. So the way I handled it, I tried to keep some of my routine that I had when I was um, back home. I also didn't go clubbing. I didn't go clubbing, but pretty much in Vegas, you can walk anywhere and drink, right? By the pool, um, I made sure that I, so we went to the gym every morning when we were there actually. And then I made sure that I had like, like fancy drink if I wanted it. I would get the bartender to make something because Vegas is an exception. It's not just like the corner bar, like they'll do whatever you asked for right and we would make sure to like tip really good too because we're not drinking you know on the morning of the wedding I went with my mother-in-law to get my makeup done and they take you in a limo and whatever and the first thing they offer you is the mimosa and orange shoot or the mimosa or whatever a champagne and orange juice and I was like and she didn't know that I was sober and I was just like oh like I'm just not feeling it I want to be like number one you know on my a game for the wedding and stuff and then later she told me like they kind of thought I, I might have been pregnant or something like that and I was like oh my god whatever right but we went back in February of this year and we went to the NHL all-star game when we were there which was so freaking cool and we had a really good time we stayed at the Bellagio and uh I was not doing well health-wise at that point this year and so it was kind of a quieter trip anyway but the one thing I find is hard is when there's like the smell of alcohol all around and that that and the music can be triggering for me I don't know I don't know how I would do in a club now and I think that's important when it comes to those boundaries is to like really make it clear to people what you're comfortable with because I've seen so many people go down the path of like oh well I'm just gonna I'm just going to have that one drink. I don't want to, I don't want to make a scene. I don't want to be awkward about it. And I'm just like, I'm going to be awkward as fuck about it. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be that person that doesn't drink on her wedding, you know? Um, so those were, Vegas is a pretty big thing. Yeah, um, nowadays exactly. though, there's still drinking, like uh, on Father's Day, we went to, to my in-laws and they don't they don't really drink but my brother-in-law drinks and there it reminded me of like I used to go everywhere with like a yeti mug that had like whatever was mixed up for the road like something in there right and that 
that's what that was. And I was like, man, I don't miss those days of like having that like security blanket everywhere you go or that false security blanket, you know? So that, that's kind of recent. Mm. I, I don't really, we don't really go out, out. We go out for dinner and stuff like that. You yeah. mentioned when you were there for your wedding, you weren't like, oh, like kind of open about your sobriety. Was there a point when you just, you know, kind of just let it all go and kind of tell everyone? Yeah. Was it like a freeing, was it like a freeing experience kind of, or kind of want to speak that? It was, yeah, it was for my one year. So I quit the day after Halloween. Halloween was always one of my biggest drinking days when I was living in Canada. Like me and my girlfriend would go out partying, my one girlfriend, and we would, both of us were single at the time, we would get wasted every time. It was just a bad scene. And I'd been trying to extricate myself from that for a couple of years before. So I'd like be like ghosting her like around Halloween every year. And she's like, make your own costume type girl. And she'd be like, where the hell are you? Like we're going, we got invited to all these parties. Right. And, um, and so I quit after Halloween. And um, when I was going to announce it last year on my one year, um, I said to my husband, I want to do something, right? And my social media was not really that big at that point. But I went to the dollar store, like around the corner from me. I got a big blow up one, like a metallic, like silver number one. I got all this confetti, all this like, like decorations and shit. And I like basically threw myself a party and got him to like take a bunch of pictures. And, uh, and then I put, I put one of them on my Facebook, which is like my personal Facebook but it's got a bunch of people on there, including my in-laws and like my husband's whole family. And it was like, surprise. Well, so my father-in-law commented on the picture and says, what's not, and he goes, what were you an alcoholic or a drunk or something? Knowing my father-in-law, this is, he did not mean anything by it, but man, that, that was hard at the time. It was very, it was to announce it to the world and then get a feedback like that from someone who was really close to me was we worked through it. Him and my mother-in-law showed up like the next day and we talked it through and they hugged and they had no idea that alcohol was a struggle. Um, but for me, I've been recovering out loud in the recovery community for like forever before that. So it felt like this natural transition, but I think sometimes the people in our lives hold us back from getting sober for a while inadvertently or not but I think that was you know I could have just never announced it but for me that was just that trap door that third option of like oh well I always have an out I had to I had to make it known so that I was living in my truth you know that happened the confetti and all that stuff and it was great it was a great thing that I did and I it just felt like that sigh of relief you said like about that freedom it was just like now I can be who I am every once in a while I'll do an interview and I'll have that little like vulnerability hangover I call it and I'll be like oh why did I say this or whatever but you know what to be honest not much I put pretty much all of it out there on social media so so what does the future hold for you? Uh, I am working on a book right now on my memoir. Um, I also have a essay coming out in a sobriety anthology. There's 11 authors I was approached about um, contributing to that. So I have, it's like a 5,000 word essay. I don't have the title of the book yet, but I should soon. Um, it's supposed to be coming out this summer and it's just from a, a small independent press. So I'm pretty excited about that because my dream has been has been to write, um, not necessarily Quitlet or anything, but I think that's a big part of my story. And I think I wouldn't be writing if I hadn't gotten sober. So that's the plan also to work one-on-one -on -one with people, help them with their, um, with their healing and their recovery through writing and through um, conversations. One day I would like to have a podcast and I keep putting it out into the universe when I talk to people because I'm like, now I have to do it, <laughs> you know? Um, so I would love to do that as well. That's kind of, that's the plan. And just keep living life here, you know? Thank you guys so much for having me. I, I just, um, I don't know. I love the opportunity, especially because you guys have just had the podcast for what, a few months, is it? Yeah, we started like end of January. Yeah. So yeah. like, I just love 
watching the evolution of podcasts. Um, one of my friends, Jill, has a podcast, Sober Powered, and like I was listening to it long before I ever became friends with her, and just like watching watching people in sobriety really like lean into their creative side and really get in touch with like the, the things that they were meant to do and their purpose is like really fulfilling. So it's, it's just, um, you know, it's an honor to be on, uh, on your podcast and be part of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Ketia. Thanks again for joining us guys. If you were someone, you know, was struggling with addiction, please reach out and ask for help. Thank you for listening.